So the topic today mainly is called uh, rotation of axes. So let's start with just a, the standard form of a conic section that we're used to seeing is something that looks like this. Now, whether you put the constant on the left or the right is really not that critical. But when we look at this, when A and B are both the same sign, we know it's an ellipse. When A and B are the same value, we know it's a circle. When A and B are opposite signs, we know it's a hyperbola. When one of A and B, not both, when one of them is zero, then we know it's a parabola. There are certain things that we can just clearly identify, okay? No, no big deal. This is what we've been working on, things of this form. But what if, you see, what if I have a parabola that actually, you know, looks like this, or I have an ellipse that looks like this, meaning it's not your usual ellipse. I've taken the x, y axes and I've rotated them through some angle. That makes this ridiculously complicated. And if I'm looking at the equation of something that's been rotated, the equation itself is kind of scary looking. It, it's just ugly. You say, well, how would I know if it was rotated? Because that's not rotated. The way you know it's rotated, and this is the general, the more general, general form. This is the form of a rotated set of axes. In other words, that guy right there, that messes everything up. So when I look at this, trying to determine what it is, isn't as simple as it was before. I can't just look at the X squared and Y squared coefficients. There's more involved. And that's part of what we're going to figure out. Can I look at this and tell you what the shape is immediately? Yes, I will show that a little later. Can I look at this and figure out what is the angle of rotation? Yes, we can also do that fairly simple. And can I reorient this on my new set of axes so that it looks like a regular parabola or ellipse or hyperbola and so on? Yeah, that's the, the gnarly algebra part, okay? So that is our goal today, is to take things of this form and convert them, okay? So let me start with then what a rotation of axes in, actually involves. draw you a picture. So this is the usual x and y axis. And let's take a point on the xy. I see on the xy plane, I'll put it right there. Here's my point x comma y. And let's call that distance r. It's, it's pretty common that on the xy plane, we call the distance from any point to the origin the r, like as in radius of a circle kind of r. That, that's, that's kind of the standard fare. Now, if I continue with my picture and I say, okay, let's do the obvious stuff. You know, if I project down, then that point would be x comma zero. If I project across, that point would be zero comma y. Okay, no big deal. Now I would like to rotate my axes through an arbitrary angle. We'll call it, and the angle we usually call phi. So now I'm going to rotate my axes. Oops, that was terrible. This is now, we're going to call the y prime and the x prime axes. These are my new set of axes, and I've rotated these through an angle of phi. Phi is a Greek letter. We all know, hopefully we all are familiar with thetas. Thetas, the little bar goes across. This is theta. This is phi. Okay. So we want What's to make the difference. Sure. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. They don't look the same. <laughs> You're like, no, no. Like X and a Z. I mean, they're, they're completely different symbols. But they're both, uh, both variables for, for angles? Both, they both represent angles, and okay. we're going to need both of them within the same problem. So that's why I say we want to make be careful. Oh, in, okay. in Calc 3, phi is used exclusively as an angle made with the Z axis in three dimensions. But in this context here, I need two different angles. We're, we're going to use theta and phi. We could have used alpha and beta. We could have used, that's not even important. Um, most calculus authors just sort of agree we're going to use the same notation. So from one calc book to the next, you're going to see the same symbols. And that's a good thing for you. If every calculus textbook did this differently and used different symbols, you know, it could be a little confusing. So phi is the angle of rotation. So I've got this new set of axes. 
So I'm also going to call this point x prime y prime, but where that point right now is x prime comma zero prime on the x prime axis. And this point here is zero prime y prime on the y prime axis. So if you look at my picture, it's the same point, but it's going to have two very different representations. So if you think numerically speaking, you know, x is this distance, y is this distance. I mean, that might be 8 comma 10. But now on the x prime, y prime, I have clearly a different value for the x and clearly a different value for the y on this new set of axes. Okay, So that's, that's important that I recognize that situation right there. And then we'll call this angle here, we'll call that one theta. Okay, now that's theta, then obviously the whole angle here would be theta plus phi. So here's our goal. My goal is to come up with an equation relating x and x prime so that I can manipulate them and move from one direction to the other. So first of all, using so ka toa, Right, everybody remember so ka toa. Look at this little triangle right here. Okay, can you tell me what x prime is? So ka toa. Well, what's the cosine of theta? Wouldn't that x be prime x prime divided r? by? Mm -hmm. So therefore, x prime would be r cosine theta. Okay, what would y prime be? You can probably figure it out without doing any work. But thinking so ka toa, oh, that would be sine, wouldn't it? So the sine of theta would be y prime over r, or this would be r sine theta. Okay. I need this. Now, let's go just to our regular everyday picture. Okay. What do we absolutely know? Again, think so ka toa, but now look at my angle that I'm using now. So, C plus theta. Yeah. So see this right triangle right here? This is my so ka toa involving x, y, but that's my angle. So therefore, x is what? Well, let's see. The cosine of this angle is x over r. So, it, so x is r cosine theta plus phi. Does everybody see that? Yep. And y is. Well, obviously it's gonna be r sine theta plus phi. I don't like theta plus phi. I'd like one angle. I'd like a cosine of theta or a cosine of phi. Do we have an expansion formula for cosine of theta plus phi? Double the double angle? Well, not the double angle, but the double angle comes from that. The double angle is actually a special case of that when they're when they're the same. Do you remember it's cos cos minus sine sine? Do you remember that one? I'll remind you in case you forgot. It's it's familiar. It's on the sheet. Yeah, this is cos alpha, cos beta, minus or plus, sine alpha, sine beta. Um, the double angle formula comes from this when alpha equals, product product of sum. Yeah, so you guys remember that because it changes. So it's if it's cosine alpha plus beta, then it's cos cos minus sine sine. And that's how people remember. But I want to use this. So this will be R. Cos theta cos phi minus r sine theta sine phi. That's what x is. Okay. Is this is this even meaningful to me in any way? Yeah. You notice something right here? <laughs> I can replace these guys with these guys. So that means x is x prime cosine phi minus y prime sine phi. Oh. So the relationship, when I rotated my axes through the angle phi, phi would be a specific angle. It's not ambiguous. It's not vague. And it's not a variable. You know, it might be pi over six, or you, you might say it in degree. It might be a 45 degree angle. Then this is the relationship between x. Now, what about the y? Let me give myself a little space here. If I do the same thing here, this would be r sine theta cos phi plus r cos theta sine phi. 
that's the expansion for, for the sine. And that's again, the double angle formula comes from there, but using the same reasoning. Okay, that means that this will give me y prime cos phi plus x prime sine phi. And so we have just created two very, very important identities now. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna write those down because I need to set them aside because I need to do a new, a new problem in a moment. So I'm gonna write those up at the top. So if I rotate my axes through an angle of phi, then absolutely x equals x prime cos phi minus y prime sine phi, and y equals y prime cos phi plus x prime sine phi, or again, x prime and y prime are my new sets of axes that have been rotated. Now, how do I use these guys? So now let's go back to the form that I said was the standard form when you've rotated. In other words, the form that had the xy term in it. We don't like the xy term. Different ways for here. So when I go back to this form here, ax squared plus bxy plus y squared plus, sorry, uh, cy squared <clears throat> plus dx plus ey plus f equals zero. Big yikes. This is the killer. As long as there is an xy term, I can't look at it and know what it looks like. I can't simply graph it. I can't even tell you where the parabola or the ellipse or the hyperbola is going to be located. But if I make this substitution into this equation, then I can manipulate it so that there is no xy term, and then I can clearly read it. And that's where the gnarly algebra is going to come from. Okay. And as it turns out, there's only a few really key spots in the problem that we need to be absolutely aware of. Now, first of all, only these terms determine what it is. Now, let me give you a really simple example. If let's, let's think of a parabola. If I wrote y equals x squared, nobody has an issue with that. So what if I said y equals x squared well, minus 2x plus 5? Is that still a parabola? Yeah. It's just a parabola where I've moved the vertex. Oh, okay. It's the x squared that made it the parabola. When I threw on other stuff, all that did was move my vertex. If I've got a, an ellipse or hyperbola, I've got the x squared and the y squared terms, then what do the x, y, and constant terms do? They move the center up, down, left, and right. These terms here do not affect what it is, they only affect where it is. Does that make sense? They, they're good, the things that I would need to complete the square in order to figure out where is the HK and that kind of thing. So we're only going to concentrate on this portion. We're going to kind of ignore this. We're going to concentrate on this portion to figure out what my shape is. Okay. And that's where the algebra comes in. So what we're going to do we're going to substitute x and y with these guys, and we're going to expand, but we're only going to do this part because it's the only part that's actually relevant. Okay, so this is going to be kind of messy. So I have a times x prime cos phi minus y prime sine phi squared plus b times x prime cos phi minus y prime sine phi times y prime cos phi. Now, if we were on campus, I would have a great big board and I could keep writing horizontally, but I don't have that luxury. <laughs> Plus c times the y squared, which would be y prime cos phi plus x prime sine phi squared. And I said, we're going to ignore this because this doesn't affect what it is. It only affects where it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to square distribute, multiply out distribute, square, distribute, and then we're going to gather terms. <laughs> it's messy, but the only terms that we care about are the x, y terms. We don't care about the x squared terms. We don't care about the y squared terms in determining the, the ickytude. I want to rid myself 
of the x, y. Well, in this case, it'd be the x prime, y prime. So when I multiply this out, and I will do it slowly, I'm going to have, okay, a times x prime squared times the cosine squared of phi minus 2a x prime y prime cos phi sine phi plus a y prime squared sine squared phi, okay? That's the square of that guy. Plus, now I'm gonna multiply this guy out. So I'll say plus, well, let's see. I'm gonna have an x prime y prime cos squared. So B x prime y prime cos squared phi. I'm gonna have an x prime squared cos phi sine phi. I'm going to have a y prime squared cos phi sine phi. And finally, I'm going to have an x prime y prime sine squared. Uh, so it'd be minus uh, with a b. Sorry, Oop, lost my b. There we go. Yeah, sorry, that's not readable. Let me do that again minus b x prime y prime okay i think that looks looks a little bit better all right and now we'll do the c so then plus y prime squared so c y prime squared plus 2 c x prime y prime cos phi sine phi plus c x prime squared sine squared phi. Now, normally I'd go put everything in here and here and here. This is getting huge and monstroculous. So at this point of the game, everywhere you see an x prime squared, we would gather those terms and put them together. Everywhere you see a y prime squared, we would gather those terms and put them together. And everywhere you see an x prime, y prime, we gather them. I'm actually only interested in the x prime, y primes. And the reason is we're going to figure out what we need to do to make it zero based on the a's, b's, and the c's. It's, it's actually pretty cool, whoever figured this out. So I've got this term. I've got this term. And I've got this term. And oh, and I've got this term here. Is that it or are there any more? Did I, did I get them all? Okay, I think, yep, I think that's all the x prime y primes. So let's get all the, let's just simply add up what are the coefficients of the x prime y prime terms? What are the coefficients? Well, right now we have negative 2a cos phi sine phi. We have plus b cos squared phi. We have minus b sine squared phi. And we have plus 2c cos phi sine phi. What I need to do is set this equal to zero. Now, a, b, and c are given in the problem. I don't have any control over the coefficients. What we have control of is the angle. In other words, if I figure out exactly what angle will make this term zero, then that is the angle of rotation that will allow me now to draw my parabola or ellipse or hyperbola in this new angle. That's the coolest part. Whatever value of phi makes this equal to zero is the one I'm looking for, okay? So I'm going to erase the stuff on top because I no longer need this. I just need this. <clears throat> okay, so if I put some of these together, like I can put these together, but you also notice, hmm, they have the same thing there. So right now I've got 2c minus 2a 
Or I could really write it as, how about if I wrote it as C minus A times two cos phi sine phi. That's what I have right now. Plus B times cos squared phi minus sine squared phi. I'm gonna set it equal to zero in a moment, but does anybody notice anything? For example, what is that exactly? That's one. No. Well, before calculus is maybe the single most important identity that you've used so far. I've mentioned it more than once. That is the... Pythagorean identity? No. Double angle? Double angle formula. Oh my God. All right. What is that? That's cosine of... And I don't say it jokingly. This is the single most important formula you probably have used in your entire life before calculus in terms of identities. Now, there's nothing, not even the Pythagorean identities that are as commonly used as that double angle formula, cos two. Oh, now, uh, you know, I said, think about that guy. <laughs> um, also the double angle. That's also the double angle formula. But yes. Oh, I wrote it cos sine, but you know, Oh my goosh, this is getting better, isn't it? So I've got a situation where this plus this, now I'm gonna set it equal to zero, which means all I really have to do is now figure out how to, I've got B cosine of two phi equal to, let me throw that guy on the other side. When I do that, what's that gonna do? It's gonna make my coefficient the opposite sign. So I'll write it as A minus C. Did we just get, oh, that's you guys. I heard a weird, my bad. Oh, no, no, yes. <laughs> yesterday it made that same really weird pinging sound before it turned us off. And by the way, the reason I, I was gonna consider posting our video, when we were done, it said fail to convert and it had actually already deleted it. So I really didn't have a choice, but it's probably just as well, because I think we lost at least 20 minutes at the end of the class. So right now, this is what I have. So the question is, okay, I'd like one trig function, obviously. So here's our, problem. here's our question. I have two routes I can go. I can either move this over here or I can move this over here. Does everybody see that? So let's suppose, here's what I mean. Sine over cos, I can write this as B over A minus C equals the sine over the cosine, which is the tangent. Or I can go the other way and say A minus C over B equals the, equals the cotangent. Well, I think it's a no brainer which way we want to go. I'd much rather use the tangent, except we have one small problem. You're doing the rotation of axes because there is a B, a non-zero B. If B were zero, this problem is trivial. We don't do a rotation. So B is not zero, period. But could A minus C be zero? Could I have the same coefficients on the x squared and the y squared terms? Is that possible? Yeah, in fact, it's ridiculously common, which means I can't use this one because I might have a zero in the denominator. Oh, so I hate to tell you folks, this is the universal formula for figuring out the angle of rotation, is you actually have to use the cotangent. I, I, I would rather use the tangent. Problem is, you're gonna get undefined a significant amount of the time, so you can't do that one. So. To figure out the angle of rotation, we just have, remember, I know A, B, and C. So I just work backwards and figure that out. I'll show you guys how to do that. Now, when we figure out the theta, or excuse me, I'm sorry, when we figure out the phi, then we actually do the cosine phi and sine phi, and we put them in there. We actually have the numbers. Then we can finish the problem. Now, the next thing is, I said, what is it? So this is to figure out the angle of rotation. But what is my shape? Well. I'm not going to go into the derivation because the derivation is really long winded. We'd go back to that thing where I substitute everything in the thing we erased and filled the board. We can go from there, but let me just go back to the simplest one. Do we actually use the tangent one sometimes or? Never, 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 never going to use it. And by the way, it won't matter. Um, do you remember how when you drew triangles to figure out, out things like think like when we did trig subs, 
and stuff like that. Remember at the end, you always drew the triangle to figure out where everything was. Yep. You're just going to do the same thing. So the triangle you draw with the cotangent, doesn't it look a lot like the triangle you draw with a tangent? Mm. Yeah. So in other words, it's actually not hard. You're not doing calculus on this. You're just going to draw your triangle and put in your numbers. So from that standpoint, this, this doesn't become terrible stuff. So I'm going to show you, okay, I'm going to show you something right here. It turns out there's a very simple identity. The derivation of this is kind of messy. It goes back to what I just did when I had to square all those nasty quantities with the X primes and the Y primes. It comes directly from that. But it turns out if I'm looking at these guys correctly, I said, it's the A, B, and the C that determine what the shape is. And I'm going to be able to prove this more formally next semester. We actually lack a little bit of the tools. When we get into the three-dimensional derivatives and three-dimensional calculus, the derivation of this is actually quite simple. But you won't understand it today because we don't know how to do derivatives in 3D. If I consider the quantity 4AC minus B squared, I have three possibilities. It's greater than zero, it equals zero, it's less than zero, okay? Remember, B is, we're assuming B is not zero, okay? We're assuming B is not zero. Turns out B is the most important number because if B is large relative to A and C, it doesn't matter how big A and C are, if B is large, B determines it. Well, let's suppose that A and C are the same sign and they're way bigger than B, then this will be a positive value. Well, if A and C are the same sign, normally, wouldn't that be an ellipse? If A and C are the same sign and they dwarf B, it's still gonna be an ellipse. But the problem is it doesn't matter if A and C are the same sign if B is large, because if this ends up being negative or if A and C are opposite signs, if A and C are opposite signs, it's already a hyperbola, or if B is really large, it's a hyperbola. Well, what do you suppose is left? <laughs> parabola. A parabola. So the easiest part, when you see a conic in rotated form, the absolute easiest, fastest, shortest part is determining what it is. I mean, that takes seconds, but it's by far the most important part. The easiest part of the process is the most important part, determining what it is. So let's do a really simple example here, okay? I'm, I'm gonna keep this really, really easy. Professor, I have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah I really like the explanations you had for it. <clears throat> greater than zero being an ellipse be less than zero parabola. Why is it when equals zero, why is that a parabola? Okay, again, it, it, it goes back to the other stuff that I did, but for this to be zero, let's just pretend for a moment Let's just pretend for a moment that we're, we're looking at this scenario here. Well, a parabola, either A or C had to be zero, didn't it? To be a parabola, either A or C had to be zero. So the product of A and C would therefore have to also be zero. In the rotated set, if this whole thing is zero, but if there was no B and either A or C were zero, it's still a parabola. So in other words, this is the strange thing. If I don't have this, this still holds true. Strangely enough, this still holds true even if, if there is no middle term there. It's crazy. Now, let me do a, a simple example. Um, I, I don't want this to be complicated at all. Let's say um, I have 2x squared plus 5xy plus 8y squared minus 3x plus 2y minus 9 equals 0. Okay, let's say I have 2x squared plus, let's see, um, 8xy plus 8y squared minus 3x plus 2y minus 9 equals 0. Let's say I have 2x squared plus 10xy plus 8y squared minus 3x plus 2y minus 9 equals 0. I've just given you three different equations that involve a rotation of axis. You know that because there's an xy term. I would like to determine what each of these shapes is. Now, if you notice, I just gave you the same equation three times. The only thing that I did was change that coefficient. So this should be pretty easy. So let's do this exactly. 
Well, in the first case, I'll number them. In the first case, four times two times eight minus five squared equals what? Fifty-four minus twenty-five. Uh, Sixty-four minus 64. Sixty-four. Sixty-four minus twenty-five. Thirty-nine. Yeah. It, is it the value that I'm concerned with? No. No, I, I'd like to get the value correct, but it's the sign. So this is an ellipse. Okay, well, I already knew it was an ellipse. That's a piece of cake. All right, well, what about number two? I've got four times two times eight minus eight squared, and that is? Zero. Zero. Oh, this one's a parabola. And in the third case, I've got four times two times eight minus 10 squared, which is? 26, negative 26. Close. <laughs> 40, 36, Jesus, yeah. Oh my goodness. Simple illustration. I just gave you three equations that all look almost identical and I got all three different shapes. You can't prejudge. <laughs> you actually have to do this for exactly the reason I'm showing you. Does that make sense why you have to do that? Because I changed one value in each one and that made the difference of what it is. So I can be a hyperbola even though these were the same sign because that term dominated, that's why. Okay, so the what is it is the most important part but it takes this long, that's it. It takes that long to figure out the what it is. Number two. What is the angle of rotation? Now, most of the time your angle of rotation is not going to be, oh, my angle of rotation is 30 degrees. No, it's probably gonna be something icky, but it's not even important what the angle of rotation is because when you're making your substitutions for X prime and Y prime, they're involved cosine and sine of phi. Those numbers will always be nice, okay? So we're gonna do an example from beginning to end so you can see all of the stages that occur in this process. Okay, by the way, um, if I said, you know, how do I find the answer here? Well, I'm going to walk you through it. But in this case here, if I said, well, what is my angle of rotation? If I wanted to know what the angle of rotation is, we'd say then, let's just look at the first one, that the cotangent of two phi is equal to what? Remember what I said? A minus C over B. That's my angle. So that's my, that's the cotangent of two phi. So we would then work backwards to figure out what phi is. So you say, how do I work backwards? I'm going to, I'm going to show you how you work backwards. By the way, cotangent and tangent, I, you see, when you take the cotangent or the tangent, because you know, they're going to be reciprocals, you see things like root threes and root three over threes and ones, you know, 45 degrees. You don't see negative six fifths. So clearly that's not a common angle. So what I would do, first of all, I'm gonna draw a picture. I know I'm in the second quadrant because it's negative. Now, remember, what's the ratio? This would be, tangent would be the y over the x, so cotangent would be the x over the y. Ah, so this would be the negative six, that would be the five. What would my hypotenuse therefore be? The square root of 36 plus 25. So that'd be what, root 61? Yep. Can you now tell me what is the, co, the cosine of two phi? Uh, adjacent over hypotenuse, so negative six divided by root 61. Okay. Now, how do I get from there to the cosine? Well, again, double angle formulas. I'm going to remind you of one that you know, but you don't use as often. We've used this before. Does this ring a bell, everyone? <laughs> Hugely important double angle formula. So I want to know what's the cosine. Oh, so what I'm going to do is take that value right there and put it right here. 
So this value would represent the square of the cosine. So the cosine would just be the square root of that. Icky, but that's what it is. Well, what would the sine be? I take that value, I put it right there. Then the sine would be the square root of this value. And those are the things I would actually use in substitution. I don't want a decimal. I actually want the exact values because as it turns out, the algebra, things will cancel and work beautifully. We're going to do one from beginning to end so I can demonstrate how, how beautifully the algebra actually always, always works if you do it right. If you don't do it correctly and there are errors along the way, the algebra can't work. Okay. So let's consider the following problem x squared plus 4xy plus 4y squared plus 6 root 5x minus 18 root y, uh, root 5y minus 45 equals zero. Now that's a mouthful. No, I'm sorry, uh, plus 45, sorry, minus 45. What was I thinking? Okay, in order. What is it? Anybody want to tell me what this is? Uh, it's a parabola. It's a parabola. Good. Four times one times four minus four squared is zero. This is a parabola. And the reason that's important is at the very end of the problem, when I get an equation in my rotated axes, it should look like a parabola. Because if it doesn't look like a parabola, then something went terribly wrong. Okay, so the parabola was easy. That was the four AC minus B squared. That's the single most important part of the problem. And you guys just did that in your head without even, you know, not much work. Number two, we now need to figure out the angle of rotation. Okay, so the cotangent of two phi is what? A minus C, so one minus four over B, that's negative three fourths. And when it comes to sines and cosines and such, three fourths is not a common ratio, darn. But that's not gonna be a problem. What I'm gonna do is draw a picture. Again, negative, so I'm in the second quadrant. Negative three, four, what's my hypotenuse? Five. Oh, I like this one so much better. That, that root 61 was kind of scary. This one's gonna be a little friendlier. So is it true that the cosine of two phi is therefore negative three fifths? Is that a true statement? Yes. Now, it doesn't matter what the sine is because the double angle formula is only going to use the cosine. So if the cosine squared of phi is simply now one half, one plus the cosine of two phi, so it's going to be one plus negative three fifths. The sine squared of phi is one half, one minus the negative three fifths. Okay, this is absolute. This is actually going to turn out to be very, very friendly numbers. I'm going to erase this. <clears throat> All right, let's simplify this. One and negative three fifths, that would be two fifths times a half, that's one fifth. Okay. One plus three fifths, that'd be eight fifths times a half. That's did I do that right? Yeah, that's four fifths. And notice cos squared plus sine squared adds to one. Is that a good thing? Yes, yeah, more. Now, because two phi was in the second quadrant, phi is automatically in the first quadrant. So I don't have to worry about absolute values. The sine and cosine are automatically going to be positive. So therefore, what is the cosine of phi? It's the square root of this. So I'm going to write one over root five. What's the sine of phi? Well, it's the square root of this. So that would be two over root five. That is critical because that's what I'm going to put into my formula for x prime and y prime and all that kind of good stuff. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to, I don't need this anymore. This was our scratch work. So now, what is it we're going to substitute? So remember what I said in terms of what we're going to substitute. Okay. What does x equal? x equals x prime, okay, times the cosine of phi. In other words, times that. Minus y prime times the sine of phi. So everywhere I see an x, I'm going to replace it with this. 
y equals y prime, okay, times the cosine of phi, plus x prime times the sine of phi. So everywhere I see an x and a y, I'm going to substitute these in. And here's how I know if I did it right. When I replace all the x's and y's all the way across now with these quantities, the x prime y prime term must cancel. If you it dropped a parentheses on your y prime. Oh, thank you. If, if I substitute these into here and the x prime y prime doesn't cancel, then it would mean that these are not correct. Okay. Uh, I lost them. They're already not correct. Hold on. Where, where's my sign? That should be. This should be a two. Y prime. Yeah, that should be. Oh boy, well, I caught that. <laughs> like I just said, if it doesn't work, you know, you have a boo boo, and that would have been a, a pretty humongous boo boo. So now I'm going to show you a little trick that I do because I'm lazier than all of you guys. The one thing I can't stand doing is writing nasty quotients with roots and all of these things all over the place. You notice everything's got a root five in it in the denominator. Could I factor that out? Yes. Could I write therefore this as one over root five times what? X prime minus two Y prime. Is that the same thing? That's the same? Yes. And how about here, one over root five times y prime plus two x prime. I just did something that is going to make this significantly less work now. If I substitute these guys in, it's some, do you really want to square this or multiply it? No, but squaring this, that's easy. Ah, so this is what I do because I'm lazy. <laughs> I want to get it right and I don't want to labor too hard. So now we're going to substitute. I'm going to replace that x with that one. Well, actually, technically that one. All right, so I've got 1 over root 5 x prime minus 2y prime squared plus 4 times 1 over root 5 x prime minus 2y prime times 1 over root 5 y prime plus 2x prime. Now, right off the bat, you notice, I'm going to be squaring this, so I'm losing the root. I'm going to be multiplying these. So again, I'm going to be losing the root. That's huge to notice something like that. Plus 4 times the square of this guy, 1 over root 5, y prime plus 2x prime, the whole thing squared. Now, I, do I need all of these to have a complete answer plus six root five times one over root five x prime minus two y prime minus 18 root five times one over root five y prime plus two x prime plus 45 and the whole thing equals zero. Now let's multiply it out and gather terms, okay? When I multiply that, I'm going to have x prime squared. I'm going to write it like that, because if you write x prime squared, <laughs> do you see a problem with that potentially? <laughs> that looks like a 12 to me, so I'm going to write x prime squared, okay? Minus 4x prime y prime plus 4y prime squared, and it's all being multiplied by a fifth. I'm being lazy. One root fed squared. Now, how about this stuff? Well, I have an x prime y prime. And then I have a minus 4x prime y prime. So that's negative 3x prime y primes. I have an 2x prime squared. And I have a minus 2 y prime squared. Now, all of this is being multiplied by 4, 1 over root 5, 1 over root 5. So that's 4 fifths, 4 fifths. So that would be negative 12 fifths, 4 fifths. So that would be 8 fifths. And then 4 fifths so would be 8 fifths. I'm only doing this because I'm going to run out of room if I don't. 
Now I do the same thing here. I'm squaring that guy. So that's plus y prime squared plus 4x prime y prime plus 4x prime squared. But it's being multiplied by 1 fifth times 4. So again, this is multiplied by 4 fifths. So 4 fifths times 4, that'd be 16 fifths times 4, that'd be 16 fifths. Now the easier part, this. So that's just six of these. So that'd be plus six X prime minus 12 Y prime minus 18 Y prime minus 36 X prime plus 45 equals zero. All righty. Now we gather. Do you mind leaving that up for a minute? Oh, I'm not, I'm not erasing that, don't worry. Not for a little bit. Now let's look for everywhere you see an X prime squared. All right, X prime squared. I think that, is that all of them? All right, I have one fifth plus eight fifths plus 16 fifths, that's 25 fifths. I like that. Right now I have five X prime squares. Now let's gather the X prime Y primes, shall we? Okay. I think, is that all of them or did I lose one? Hold the phone here, hold on. Um, for some reason, it looks like I'm missing one. Hold on, something's not quite right. Where, where am I gaining or losing one? Hold on. Um, an X prime, Y prime, so minus three of them. So this should have been minus 12 fifths. Okay, no, that's, that's okay. Uh, there's a, okay, I thought we were thinking there was a fourth one. There's only three. All right, I have negative four fifths of them, negative 12 fifths of them, plus 16 fifths of them. How many does that leave me of them? None. Is that a good thing? Yes. Yeah, that had to be zero. So I'm going to go like this. They are now off our hands. Now what's left? Let's look at the Y prime squares. I apologize. When, when I'm looking at this at close range, it's just, it's like watching the Matrix movies, you know, when all this stuff is coming down on the screen. That's what it looks like after a while <laughs> at this close. So I have four fifths minus eight fifths plus four fifths, huh. four fifths, four fifths, minus eight fifths. Those are gonna to cancel too, aren't they? Hmm, okay, there's no Y squareds or Y prime squareds. Now let's look at the X's and the Y's. Um, now we're down to here. I've got six X primes minus 36 X primes. So that would be minus 30 X primes. I've got, Negative 12 Y primes minus 18 Y primes, that's minus 30 Y primes, plus 45 equals zero. So in the X prime Y prime world, I only have one squared term. Hmm. When you only have one squared term, what do you got? Parabola. 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 What did we say at the beginning? Parabola. Parabola. Yeah, that's a good thing. Now, right now, that's not terrible, but I don't like the way it looks yet. So I am going to erase a little bit. Sorry about that, but it's just being recorded, so. Speaking of the matrix, uh, did, you, did you hear about the new one? They're making a new one. Oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> well, they are. <laughs> I think they should have stopped at one, personally. <laughs> I'm not a big sequels guy. All right, so in this situation here, I really want to get the Y by myself, don't I? So let me write it up here. So I've got five X prime squared minus 30 X prime 
plus 45. How about if I write that equals 30y prime? Now, let's just look at this for a moment. If I factor the five out, I'd have x prime squared minus six x prime plus nine. Does anybody recognize that right there? That's perfect a perfect square. square. Yeah, that's just x prime minus three minus quantity three. squared. Ooh, boy, this is getting better all the time, isn't it? Now, I would suggest at this point, multiply both sides by one over 30. And now you'll have y prime equals five over 30 would be one sixth x prime minus three quantity squared. Now, if I remove the primes, you'd say, oh, that's a really easy parabola to draw in regular xy world, except we're not in regular xy world. We're in this land of the, of the lost here. This is our rotated axis equation. That doesn't look so scary because there's no x primes, there's no y primes. It came from this, hard to believe. Now, here's, here's the coolest part. You can use all the computer technology you want and you're gonna have a difficult time graphing this because, well, it's not a function. <laughs> that would be really a nasty thing, but that'll be easy to graph except for one small problem. What is my angle of rotation again? What was the cosine? What was the cosine of phi? One divided by root five. So I wanna give you a rough sketch. So why don't I find the value of phi? Oh, now would I want to find this in radians or degrees for the purposes of graphing? Degrees. Yeah, because if I if I said, oh, it's a 0. 0.374 radians, you'd go, okay, cool. I have no idea how big that is. No, for the purpose of graphing, put it in degrees so that it makes some sense to you. So I'm gonna put my calculator in degree mode. I'm gonna find the inverse cosine of one over root five. And that's about, that's about 63.4 degrees. Oh, okay. So what does that mean? That means that my rotated set of axes Forty five, I'd say probably you know, maybe that ish. I'm freehanding this probably about like that. So then about well, not, not a little extreme. Tilt my head a little bit here. Okay, I can do circles. I can't really do lines very well. So in other words, there's our there's our fee. Now this is your new x prime. That's your new y prime axis. So that means. My vertex is at three comma zero on the new axis. So one, two, three. The one six means it's kind of flat, doesn't it? All right, so it's gonna kind of be like that. There. That is actually a very, very accurate graph of that. <laughs> now, I never need you to draw a graph, ever. But it's nice to know what it actually looks like. That actually looks like this. So there's three parts to this problem. The first, identification of what it is. That's the easiest, the fastest, by far the most important. Second, what is the angle of rotation? Well, cosine phi equals one over root five is good enough for now, but if I actually needed a number, I would use this. You notice we never used this number anywhere in the problem. We only used the fact that the cosine was this because that's what we substituted in. And thirdly, what is the new equation in the rotated plane? In other words, my new equation does not have an x, y, or an x prime, y prime term. That's the nastiest, gnarliest, busiest part. And in the long run, it's actually the least important. Because when you get to 3D, you're never going to actually physically rewrite the problem. You're going to recognize that it's a parabola or an ellipse or a hyperbola that's been rotated. And it's also rotated in 3D. And once you identify what it is, you don't really need to do much else. So unfortunately, a lot of people spend way too much time on the all of the algebra to produce this rather than what is it? Now, we figured out it was a parabola immediately. What we didn't know was where the parabola was. That's what we did here. But the what is it still way more important. All right, would we're going to move on in a moment. Does anybody have any questions on this before we go? Would that kind of problem be on the exam? Well, the earlier part, certainly. Now, by the way, when, when I ask, if I put this kind of question on an exam. Like with that algebra, I mean. Yeah, would I, if I ask this kind of question on an exam, do you know what I usually will do? Okay. 
something like that. <laughs> in other words, less stuff. So you can get you can get through it a little faster. Okay. Yeah, but the, the question I'm gonna ask you is, you know, what is it? What's your angle of rotation? If you look on your next quiz on this, you'll see most of the questions are what is it? What's your angle of rotation? Because that is the most important. Now we're gonna completely switch gears. This is a different chapter now. This we're gonna begin our last chapter of stuff. Is that the polar stuff? That's well, that's the last last of the last chapter of stuff. So we're not quite to polar yet, but we will get to polar. We're gonna look at what are, what is called parameterization. That's a long word, parameterization. Now, in, when you get into my linear algebra class, this becomes an everyday skill that you do probably more than anything else. People think, well, I thought it was all vectors and matrices. Yeah, you use vectors and matrices, but it's actually the ability to parameterize solutions that may be the most useful skill. So I'm gonna give you an example of something you did in baby algebra. You may not realize this because this was a long time ago. So I want you to solve the following system of equations. Let's, I'll keep it really simple. You're going to solve how about 3x minus y equals 6. And you're going to solve um, how about um, 12 minus 6x equals negative 2y. I want to solve this system of equations, OK? Well, we know there's a whole bunch of ways. I could draw graphs and look at the intersection. That's inefficient. I can solve for one of the variables and substitute it into the other equation. I could line them up, add them to eliminate coefficients. That's We're all familiar with that, I, I would hope. So I want to do this. So maybe I'll just rewrite this in slope-intercept form. Then that would be y equals 3x minus 6. So if I solve for y here, what's the second one going to be? If I multiply through by negative a half, that would be, oh, um, uh, is this a problem? I gave you two equations that look different, and I said solve this system. And what did you just come up with? They're the, the same. Exact same. They're the same line. Is, is that a possibility? Yeah. I well, actually, the further you go in math, that is... 99.99999% of all the problems, that's what they're going to be. You're never going to have the problem that has the one happy intersection because that problem is not interesting. That problem is not useful. And that problem will never show up in reality. So I've just figured out that, oh my God, my solution to the same line. So how do I answer that? Well, again, going back to baby algebra, if I gave you two lines on the plane, there were three possibilities, if you remember. First possibility. They intersect, I gave you a happy point of intersection. Second possibility, we just did it. I have that line and I have that line, same line. And what was the third possibility? Do you remember? I'll write it over here. Parallel. You had two lines that never intersected, they were parallel. So we said this was an inconsistent system. These are both consistent because they both have answers. It's just that this has a unique solution and this is what we call a dependent system. It has infinitely many solutions. Yeah. But here's the problem that most of the algebra books do. They'll say, there's an infinite number of solutions. You go, okay, so, so where are they? Oh, there's infinitely many. Doesn't that make it feel right off the bat like the whole X, Y plane is your answer? I remember when my youngest son was taking, uh, I think it was a pre-calc course, and he said, I don't understand this. It says there's infinitely many. It makes it sound like it's the whole XY plane, but he says it's not. It's only the points on the line that are the solution. And yeah, it yeah. doesn't take there's up a, very much of the XY plane, does it? There's a notation we used to, we used to write. So um, there's a way of doing this. Now, our favorite answer when we're growing up in math, our favorite answer is, you know, the answer is three comma five. I got one unique point, right? Just a simple ordered pair. I'd still like to represent my answer as an ordered pair but there's infinitely many. So here's what we do. This is what you're going to learn how to do in linear algebra that you did not do in lower level algebra. You're going to do what's called a parameterization. You're going to choose a new variable that is external to the problem. So not X or Y. I'm gonna pick a new variable, call it T. And I'm gonna say, let X equal T. If X, I could also pick Y equal T, but then it'd be messier. If X equals T, then what does Y equal? If x 3t minus 6. 3t minus 6. So my answer is 
the set of all ordered pairs of the form x, y. That's my parameterized solution. Now, let's do a quick check. If t is 0, then y is negative 6. Okay, that works. If t is 2, then y is 0. Well, that works. In fact, for every real number t you could put in here, I will get a point on the line. But the benefit about this solution is that I'm not saying there's infinitely many points and then not telling you where they are. No. I said every ordered pair of this form, pick any real number t and then the y will be this. This is called a parameterized solution. They don't do this in the lower level courses, and I don't know why, because this is the answer. The answer isn't infinitely many, because that, that's vague and ambiguous. You don't know where, they, where are the infinitely many, because not everything. So a parameterization is when you choose an external variable to represent your solution. Now, there's two ways. I could be parameterizing it, or I can take a parameterized solution and then work backwards to figure out where it came from in XY world. We're going to do both. So someone asked about polar coordinates. Polar coordinates is a form of parameterization that's very, very specific, right? Because I come up with the R theta instead of the XY. But we'll, we're going to do that later. That, that's not as important yet. So let's consider the following. Let's consider I have the following situation. I'm going to tell you that um, x is t plus 2 and y is, um, let's say, I'll keep it simple. y is t squared plus 4. All right. And I'd like to know, what, what does this look like on the xy plane? I'd like to know what the graph actually looks like. And could I write this in xy terms? Well, there's a couple of ways I can go about this, okay? I can start with something like this. Now, when you were in baby algebra and you were first graphing, you always made a table of values. You guys remember that? You know, the X, Y, and, and which is really funny because you don't want to do that when you're graphing lines because all you need is your slope and then you just, you know, extend it. So I'm going to do T, X, Y. And let's just pick a few small values. Maybe T is negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. Keep it small. I want to be able to fit this on the page. Well, when t is negative 2, x would be 0, and then be 1, and 2, and 3, and 4. When t is negative 2, this y would be 8, then it would be 5, then it would be 4, then it would be 5, then it would be 8 again. Now, this is very crude, what I'm doing. This is not the how-to. This is to kind of give us a simple feel of what the heck we're finding here. So I'm looking at these ordered pairs right now. So 0, 8, all right, 1, 5. I'm just going to go quick here. So 1, 5 about there, 2, 4, and then 3, 5, and then 4, 8. Huh. What does this kind of feel like? Parabola. Kind of feels like a parabola, doesn't it? Maybe this is the wise relationship to T. Maybe it's, oh, you know what I could do? Could I write T equals X minus two? And then what would this be? X minus two squared plus four. Oh, oh. oh my gosh. Well, this would have been better, obviously, but we didn't know that. It turns out if you can solve for that T and then manipulate it and put it back in, you would do that because this would be far more useful. But this right here is a parameterization of this parabola right here, okay? Y equals this is per, can be parameterized that way. For any individual uh, curve you could think of, there's an infinite number of parameterizations. That's that's good. That goes without saying. So let's let's try another one. All right. What if I have something like this? X equals. Whoops. Not X. X equals. How about um. Let's say. Let's keep this real simple. Um, 4 cos theta minus 3 
actually, let me use T, sorry. I, I typically like to use T in this regard. Y equals two sine uh, T plus six. And let's say that T is gonna range from zero to two pi. And the reason I'm gonna say zero to two pi is if I make the range bigger than that, I just keep recycling the same points over and over again. Oh my gosh, this, I really don't wanna plot points here. I can, clearly I would only pick common angles. And do we agree that, that this would be kind of, kind of busy if I try to plot points here? Well, I could try to solve for T, but then T would be an inverse cosine or an inverse sine and I'd have to plug it into the other. That's just, that's probably not a great idea either. I have a cosine in one equation. I have a sine in the other. Do we have any relationships in, regarding sines and cosines? That we might be able yes. to exploit, such as. Can anybody think of a relationship involving sine and cosine graphics? Sine squared plus sine cosine squared. squared. So there's a Pythagorean relationship involving sine and cosine. Well, I don't see it, but what if I isolate the cos t and I isolate the sine t? What if we do that first? So if I add three to both sides and divide by four, is it true that cos t equals x plus three over four? Is that a true statement? Yes. And how about here? Can I say that the sine of t is equal to y minus six over two? Well, did I make my life easier or harder? Well, what is the cos squared t plus the sine squared t in this case? Won't it be x plus three over four squared plus y minus six over two squared? And what must this equal? One. How about if I rewrite it like this? <laughs> How about if I rewrite it like this? Maybe it'll be. <laughs> Get out of town. What is this? What, what is this? It's. I forgot. An ellipse. It's a hyper. Didn't you ellipse. Ellipse. An ellipse. Standard at negative three comma six. Opening horizontally. Oh my goodness. From this. Yeah. No. So why are we doing this weird new form of math? It's actually really simple. Is an ellipse a function? Is an ellipse a function? No, it's not. No, it's a hyperbola a function. No, is a sideways opening parabola a function? No, figure eight. There's an infinite number of really cool shapes, circles that are not functions, yet I still might want to talk about derivatives, arc length, area. I might want to talk about things about them, but because they're not functions, the calculus of things that are not functions can be really, really rough. Can you like um, split them up? Like if you, if you think of a parabola, can you like think of it? Um, as two functions instead of one. Oh, Literally. if I want to graph a circle on my graphing calculator, I yeah, something like that. Bottom half. You're right. But what if I want to take a derivative? Things of that nature become a little trickier when things aren't functions. But here's the thing: when I parameterize a curve, x is clearly a function of t, y is clearly mm. a function of t. So I can clearly take derivatives of x and y with respect to t. Um, and then maybe integration. There's things that I can do because I parameterize that I could not do if I hadn't parameterized. That's one of the benefits of parameterization is there, I can take things that are not functions, particularly things like conic sections and talk about derivatives in general without having to differentiate implicitly, which is the only other thing you have in Calc 1. So parameterization is critical. Now I'm gonna change something about this problem. I'm gonna change Let's say, do we agree that this is still the equation? Is that still true? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it still the ellipse? Is it still? I think it's the same ellipse. No. We it's half the leaps. We know that sine and cosine are going to complete their loops from zero to two pi. That's why I said zero to two pi. By the way, if I said two pi to four pi, seven pi to nine pi, as long as it's it, going it, to rotate more or rotate. So less. it's it's half it's half the leaps. It's the left half, isn't it? 
Uh, let's do this. I, I actually, this is one I do want to draw because that's you. You guys are hitting on the problem here. It's like, is there something weird? So negative three comma six is my center. I went left and right four units. I went up and down two. So my first picture was, you know, something like this, right? That's the, from zero to two pi. But now I said pi over two to three pi over two. Pi over two to three pi over two would be only that. Mm. Oh, I put a restriction. Whenever you have a restriction on your domain, which I just did, when you put a restriction on there, it might not be the whole graph. So the correct answer to this, this is the equation, but it's only the left half of this ellipse. Ah because I did not use the whole zero to two pi. Now, how would I have known? Well, it's sine and cosine. We know sine and cosine completely cycle zero to two pi. So if I had used more than zero to two pi, like someone said, I'd just be going round and round. It's still the same graph. I'm just you know, retracing my steps. So that's, it's very important to recognize if you have. Now, one of the questions that I ask you on the new quiz, I'll say, put this you know, in X and Y and describe the graph. And so describe the graph doesn't mean it, it's pretty, it's, it's blue, it's really friendly. No, describe the graph is it's the left side of an ellipse centered at negative three comma six. That's describing the graph. So when you see describe the graph, it's what is it, where is it, is it the whole thing? That, that's always what you're going to do when you describe a graph. I always have fun with that one because I get some really goofy answers sometimes. Professor, I do have a question. Yes. Go ahead, Yaman. Um, th that domain, when it was like from zero to pi, how, wh where did you come up with that originally? Oh, I, I said, and it was zero to two pi. Because when I'm doing, when I'm doing a triggish thing, if you don't have any information, assume there's no restriction. So I started by saying, and t is between zero and two pi. I wasn't creating a res restriction. I was doing that. So you'd say, oh, that's the whole thing. Then now I created a restriction. And in, in a problem, you would uh, give us that restriction later, or was this something well, no, no, that we have to of, derive? It would be part of the problem. It would, be, it would definitely be part of the problem. Oh, wow. So restrictions can happen, and you don't even see them sometimes. And that's where you got to be a little bit careful. Let's say, let's, keep, let's do a really, really simple one. I've got x equals the square root of t, y equals t. And you could say, oh, wait a minute. So that would mean t equals x squared. Oh, duh. OK, everybody cool with that? It's a piece of cake. Oh, my god, this is so easy. So my graph is just this, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, there's What's absolute wrong? value. No, no absolute values. Um, um, you, can't, you can't have a 0. Well, yeah, I got a zero. If t is zero, x is zero. That's fine. If t uh, is negative, negative positive negatives, number, you can have negatives. I can't have negatives. Will I ever get a negative x value? Yeah, if you, it's x squared. Will I ever get a negative x value? Can the square not. root of t give me a negative value? No. Well, then we have to restrict t to not be. T's inside a square root. <laughs> can I have? So it a can't be negative. Value? Would you agree that? Right now, would you agree that without me telling you, would you agree this is a restriction? Yes. Unless you have imaginary but numbers. Is, yeah, well, we can't, you can't graph or parameterize imaginary numbers. Remember, we're doing real valued calculus. So imaginary numbers are really off the table. So the, yeah. the, the restriction comes implied, right? That's implied. So therefore, tell me about X. X also only exists on the zero. Oh, so. It's only the right side of the parabola. Yes. That, that's what I mean. I didn't give you a restriction. The restriction was built in right here because T, it doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter that I say that. This cannot produce a negative value. Therefore, there's no negative values of X. Ah, no, I don't care about the Y. There's no negative X's. So that was only, so you'd say the right side of the parabola Y equal X squared. Um, yes. Professor, I have a question. Uh, I don't know if it's useful or dumb question. Uh, if this is like, this seems a lot more accessible, a lot more useful in many ways. Why are we still using the other method as well with the X minus two squared divided by a squared when this seems more practical? I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, 
He just lost. So it. doing it this way, as in like using the T's like to parameterize and like play around with the mm -hmm. ellipses or the behaviors in general just seems a lot more useful than. Well, if, if things in X, Y world, I'd rather just use things in X, Y world. I, I really would. It's just, you know, if I give you a function. Using the T would overcomplicate it. This would be for things that are more complicated. You wouldn't okay. use this for simple stuff. Use simple stuff for simple stuff. Now, what about the next one? This, this, is, this is one of my personal favorites, by the way. All right. I've got, let's say, um, how do I want to do this? Um, uh, I'm trying to think how, okay, I've got, what's the simplest? Hold on. Um, Like we all drank at the same time, coffee, me, and Ted. Okay. This is this is one of my personal favorites. And by the way, by me doing that, there are no restrictions. We, we are going to study this particular one a couple of different times over the next few days. Now, when I'm staring at this for a moment, X, you could say clearly that cosine of t is the cube root of x. You could say sine of t is the cube root of y because cube roots are not a problem. I can have a cube root be positive or negative. Everybody cool with that? No issues. So for, for as I range through all the values, the cosine is going to range from negative one to one. Now I'm going to cube it. It's still going to range from negative one to one. So x is going to range from negative one to one. In fact, I'm going to go even a step further. There are four points that I can clearly identify. Let's start with t equals zero. If t equals zero, I have cos zero quantity cubed. That's just one. So when t equals zero, x is one and y is zero. Zero. So one comma zero is clearly on my graph. Okay. Now, how about pi? Cosine of pi is negative one. Therefore, the cube of cosine of pi is also negative one. So when, when t is pi, x is negative one. Sine of pi is zero. So I'm going to have the point negative one comma zero. Oh, okay, cool. Now, what other angles do you think we might want to consider? Pi over two. All right, let's start with pi over two. Cosine of pi over two is zero, so its cube is still zero. So when t is pi over two, x is zero. When t is pi over two, the sine of pi over two is one, therefore its cube would still be one. So zero comma one. Oh boy, guess where the next one's gonna end up? <laughs> zero, negative one. Yeah, if I use three pi over two, I'd have zero, I'd have, okay, great. So I have a graph with these four points. This I absolutely know. What I don't know is uh, <laughs> what are the rest of the points? So for various values of t, this can be really icky because you know even if I pick a common angle and I find the sine and cosine of it, now I got a qubit, so now it's probably not so happy. Yikes. Well, what did we do before when we had sine and cosine? Didn't we manipulate a Pythagorean identity somewhere along the way? Something like that. Tell me, what's the cosine squared of t equal? Um, x over... Not over. Cosine t. How can I get... Let me, let me put it this way. If I said... I have A equals B cubed. How can I get a B squared? Uh, a over B equals B squared? No. How can I get a B squared? Oh, square root of uh, square root. three halves oh. or something. We're on the right path. Not the yeah, yeah, you have thirds. to manipulate the exponential. We what? had that in the quiz. Would, would that give me, would that work? Yes. Yeah. Um, so what does cos squared t equal? X to the, the two-thirds. The two-thirds. Okay. What does sine squared t equal? Y two-thirds. Y to the two-thirds. And by the way, as long as we're at it, what does this equal? One. That is our graph in XY world. Whoa. But that's not the coolest part.
I affectionately call this graph my ninja throwing star. And you gotta be careful. Ouch, it's really sharp. It's sharp at both ends because you have vertical tangents, you have horizontal tangents. When we look at the calculus of this, the derivatives tomorrow, crazy results. There's no way you could plot points and see this. But by doing this, and we're gonna learn how to manipulate this, it actually is not that, it's not as hard as you think. So here's a perfect example of getting parameterization. Would you say that's not a function? Yeah, that's not a function. Yeah, in fact, the four endpoints here, I have weird stuff going on. What's happening at all four of these points? There's a word. Asymptote. Well, there's no, there's no asymptotes. It's oh, just, right, yeah, it's, yeah. I heard, I think somebody squeezed it in. Cusp, there's a cusp. Corner? Cusp, that's there are it. Four, there are four cusps there. Remember, cusps are those things that have that kind of a feel to them. There are four cusps, crazy, crazy cool stuff. But it comes from this particular parameterization. I put this in there to say there's no restrictions. I don't expect that you know what that looks like. Not now. No, no. I'm, I'm telling you that's what it looks like. But if I do the graph of this and I say, well, I can't do this on my calculator. No, but I think Yaman said earlier, if I think top half, bottom half, I can, I can actually manipulate this so I can produce that. You gotta be a little bit clever. But this is introduction to parameterization. There's no calculus in this today. Tomorrow, what we're going to do is, okay, how do I find derivatives of parametrically defined curves? How do I find arc length of parametrically defined curves? And that turns out to be a very powerful tool. So we don't automatically parameterize everything. No, no, we do it if it makes our life easier. If it makes something like this, which looks, I, you know, there's no Pythagorean relationship between cos cubed and sine cubed. But creating a situation where I can now have an equation in an x, y world. Now, when I go back to here, x and y are functions of t. Right now, this is not a function in x, y world, but it's functions in the t world. And that's where we're going to exploit the parameterization. All right. So let me stop here.